Thank you, Nirosh. All right, good morning, everybody. Uh, this is way more formal than I'm used to, so I'm going to just walk around and, and speak in my uh, usual side. So, uh, welcome to the summit. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here and to talk to you a little bit about our approach for digital transformation and what we think about it and how we uh, encourage and support customers to move in that direction. Uh, uh, we are running a little bit late. I'm going to try to finish uh, a bit earlier uh, than planned so we can have a bit more, uh, with some time for questions as well. All right, a little bit about WS2. I think about half the people here have not done much work with us before, so a little bit of history about the company. Uh, I'm the founder of the company. We started in 2005. We have about uh, 450, 460 people now. Very tech heavy, very engineering heavy. 300 people are engineers. The, every product we build is 100% open source. So we're very committed to the idea that open source is the right way to build and distribute products and make a business out of it. But there aren't many companies that have this approach. Red Hat is, a, uh, is sort of the standard bearer for uh, really open source software. Everybody else is some kind of an open source bit, but not the whole thing is open source. Uh, the, the company was set up in 2005 with the idea of creating an entire technology platform to enable businesses to do faster, better, cheaper integration and interaction and new kind of technology. And when we started, we built it on the focus of services and SOA kind of approaches. It's a sale still in 12 years, we've never really had to change any strategy path. We set out to build a foundation, a basis for the technology platform, and that's really what we've been doing for 12 years. Uh, what the way we package the products now is much more focused towards digital transformation enablement. And so we are really a, a, a set of products that help customers build whatever the digital transformation approaches they want to build. And at the end of the day, I'm going to talk a little bit about the products. This talk is not really about products at all, and I'll, I'll explain what we can talk about. A, uh, we operate in, the, we have offices in the U.S. Uh, we have two in the U.S., one in California, one in New York. Uh, one in London, uh, one in Brazil, and in Sri Lanka, and two officers in Sri Lanka as well. A tech companies, the last box is kind of important from the way this world works these days. Uh, if you look at most tech companies, they, they bleed money like there's no tomorrow. That's the way it works. They spend more money on sales and marketing than the amount of money they generate, typically. Uh, we, uh, we are not operating like that. We are running, uh, this year we are going to be a fully profitable business as a, as a model. We are very, very close last year, so we're very confident we can get to that this year. And the objective is to make a sustainable business, a sustainable company, not something that is designed to go to Wall Street, get some money, and then go home and do something else. I'm a technical guy, fu fundamentally. I, I spend most of my time on technical stuff, even though I'm the CEO. Uh, I have a second title, which I gave myself, called Chief Architect, which is where most of my time is spent, uh, honestly. And I really enjoy that, and I, we tend to look long-term. And this is really what this presentation is about, is the, is the uh, technology and culture and how it all fits together and, and so forth. Right? So, so, this is a, a, so we are a company that is designed not to uh, sell to somebody and get on with it and go to some other startup and so forth or whatever, but to be a sustainable business that stays, uh, if we are successful, forever as a technology provider. And, and of course, evolving as technology evolves, and uh, as everything we touch, you know, today is changed tomorrow. That's just the way the game is played. So let, let's come back to digital transformation. Uh, so what is digital transformation? What does it really mean? And why is it an important topic to talk about? Uh, so the first thing, of course, is that a, a, this uh, Mark Andreessen, uh, who's the, one of the guy who wrote the Mosaic browser, which is sort of the foundation of the web becoming consumer level, I uh, wrote an article in the Wall Street Journal, um, I don't know, maybe five years ago, called Software is Eating the World. And it's really a really good essay. It's, it's uh, worth reading it. And the point that he made, probably it was more than five years ago, was really about the, the idea that every business, every product, every area of work is going to become powered by software in very short order. And we see that all over the place now, right? There's no... There's no shortage of that. And of course, AI as an aspect of software, software is driving that even, even much, much further now. Uh, and, and if you don't respond to that, uh, it's kind of, or if you respond the wrong way, uh, like BlackBerry did, for example, or Nokia tried, uh, you become an anecdote in the story. That's what happened to all these guys. I mean, BlackBerry missed the concept of an app store, of the idea that you need to allow people to innovate and build on your platform and make it a generative platform, that idea they missed. And Apple and, and Android 
you know, kick button on them, and they're now back on trying to make hardware for Android, uh, which is great. Uh, it, it's not what the company was uh, in, in what they're trying to do. Uh, and the second part, so, so really, so the point there is software is a major uh, influence on everything we do now. And so if you don't respond and figure out how to apply that approach, it's going to be very difficult to survive. The second one is the, the Uberized experience, the experience of using Uber to go from place to place versus uh, the old experience of either going out and standing on the road waiting for a taxi or something to come by or calling someone and giving them the directions and then ex hoping they'll show up at the right time. Uh, this experience is so much better for consumers. Now, Uber has its own interesting set of challenges for other people, for, for the taxi drivers and so forth. Uh, a, a, but uh, from a consumer point of view, a Uber gives a much, much better experience for people, simply because there's more information provided to the person on what's going on, who's doing what. All of that information is very much in front of you. And you have a much more trust-building relationship with the driver, because both people rate each other and, and so forth. Right. So, so uh, when, when you are, and, and this touches upon the third bullet, which is that we are now dealing with consumers who are born digital. Right? They're digital native consumers. My generation was not digital native. We were born before the, the, the sort of the software age took over. The current generation is all born after the software took over. Many of them are born with the iPhone, basically. So that means the expectations they have from organizations, uh, especially because they're used to Google just simply knowing everything for you. Whenever you need to know it, it knows it for you. Uh, Facebook telling you everything about what's going on in the world in your social network. And Twitter being a way, great way to keep track of everybody, sort of keep track of what's going on and following, capturing information and to Snapchat, to all blah, blah, blah. All of this is what people are naturally used to. So when you go to the enterprise world, most of the time we are far from that world. And then people who have to interact with that uh, they will interact when they have to interact because they have no choice. If it's a government, you don't have a choice. If it's a bank, in many cases, you don't have a choice. But now choices are appearing. So that's what's happening. So if you don't get the, the business transformed to being a, something that really supports digital native consumers and employees and partners and everything else, be like, well, I, I don't want to work here because it's boring to work here. I have to fill silly forms. You know, I got to do all this stuff. when. And the other thing, it just reads my email and it knows what to do and just organizes everything for me and I don't need to fill a form anymore. Right? So it's an entirely different kind of experience that you can have if you have technology applied to that level. And that's really what digital transformation is, is, is uh, trying to get to. So what does it mean from a business point of view and wh what's driving that? Uh, so the first, of course, is things like Uber. It's the technology-enabled businesses and digital products. Uh, so we have one of our customers uh, in, in the US uh, has a, it's an insurance analytics company, and they they get the data from uh, so they they are now tapping into the data that uh, GM OnStar produces, and from that one they compute information about the driver quality and they sell that data back to insurance companies, right? So here the data is kind of owned by the customer who owns a car, but not really in practice, and GM owns the data, and GM has a derived product which is used to create another derived product. It's so almost like financial derivatives applied to data. Right? So you derive, 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 and you create new value and you sell it to somebody else. That's digital products. That kind of capability is, is uh, uh, what digital transformation allows you to do. Instead of just saying, well, I made this thing. I can sell this flashlight or light bulb or whatever it is. Now I can create additional values that, uh, create that, that people are willing to pay for. Um, along with that is improving customer experience. This comes back again to the same point. I made earlier about the way uh, people expect uh, to work with businesses. Right? They don't want to stand in a line. They don't need to stand in a line. They don't need to come and visit. Uh, you know, more, more and more people in the US, uh, I'm not sure what, it is in, what the level is in the UK, but certainly in California and so forth, uh, going to a grocery store is becoming old fashioned now. Why do I need to go to a grocery store? I, you know, I buy everything online, then, then I can refresh automatically. It knows my usage pattern. Then, and this is without having a connected fridge that knows everything about you. Right? And, and, uh, and there are all these uh, half-cooked uh, suppliers now which give you everything prepackaged. There's something called Blue Apron in California and a few places. I'm not sure if it's in London. Uh, you basically say, I want a meal for two people, and you can pick a meal. And it gives you all the ingredients, all the recipe, everything you need. 
single use basically. You take it home, you cook it, in 15 minutes you have a really nice meal. And you have no leftovers, you have no nothing. Everything is thrown out and that's it. You start from zero for the next time around, which is not the way normal kitchens work, of course. Uh, but so, so it's a huge improvement in customer experience you can achieve with technology. Uh, a, a, and, and, and the third point is back to the idea of, of traditional business operations. I, everybody needs to become more efficient. That's just an ongoing mantra that will never finish. So we've been doing this for many, many years, right? There's the mainframe era, then there was the enterprise integration. There's all these kind of various attempts and, and ongoing efforts to make businesses more efficient. Uh, and tech, digital transformation is yet another step in that. And this is never going to stop, of course, right? So you'll always want to look for different ways of making things better, faster, cheaper, et cetera. That's just the way the system works. So this is, these are the kinds of things that, that we believe that, that people uh, want to achieve from digital transformation. Now the question is, how do you get there? Uh, and really, the, most of the talk, uh, my conversation is going to be about these topics. Uh, because to get there is, is not just a matter of technology. It's also a big part of it is business culture and the organizational behavior. And, uh, and it's a marriage of these two working well together which is really what the challenge is, because it didn't have to be like that for a very long time. Technology people could do something, business people do something, and they meet at meetings once in a way. This is a different world. Right? So let me talk about a few aspects of that, and, and then we'll, uh, I'm happy to take some questions and we'll wrap up. Uh, so the first thing is technology vision. Uh, for any organization today, it doesn't matter what you do, you have to have a direction of what is the technology, what kind of things should we do, what are things we should adopt? How should we adopt it? What are the alternatives and so forth? Uh, there was a time when that was done by the top person, right? And they would go for conferences, they'd meet people. It was always a top-down model. Today, a, a, my kids know more about the things you can do with a phone a heck of a lot more than I know. And I know everything about how to make it work, right? But they don't know how to make it work, but they know how to make it work for them far better than I do. So, so if I don't monitor, uh, not for the purpose necessarily of monitoring, monitor what they do to understand what that means, I can't figure out how to make it, make the technology driving it, right? So same thing applies in the enterprise. There are, it's no longer something that, that a, a one person or the senior people know the answers. It is much more democratized. Everybody has an opinion, and everybody's opinion is legitimate. Uh, Obviously, you can't have everybody do whatever they want. You have to have some consistency and some direction and some guidance, right? Uh, a, but it's, it's a very important aspect to say, look, bring everybody together. Right? And, and also, there are some other aspects. So, so for example, a, you shouldn't really believe anybody either because people will come up with all kinds of things. Oh, my God, all you have to do is do this Instagram thing, and then you're fine, or whatever the next thing is. But uh, the, this is like religions. Technology adoption is like religions. People who believe the religion, 100% committed that that's the right answer. Right? And the other guy who believes the other religion, 100% committed that's the right answer. And there's no way to get them to really unify. We see in world politics and world organization structure what that means. Right? Uh, uh, so, so you have to get to a point where you really, you, you, if you really want to be effective on a long-term basis, you have to say, Okay, I have these beliefs, but I don't know, I, I want to see evidence that this is the right belief. And over time, it has to change. Uh, this idea of dispassionately passionate, this is something I really like. Uh, the idea that when, you, when you're doing something, you must be 100% passionate for that. You've got to commit and not be waffly, not be wishy-washy, nothing. You decide you're going to do it, you do it. But at the same time, even if you're the one who sponsored it and you're the one who led it and so forth, you have to be able to step back and say, well, okay, we did that. Well, that worked so far. Now, now it's crap. Now it's terrible. Now I'm going to get rid of it and do something else, right? And 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 not let that be you becoming, you know, useless or whatever, right? It's not that. It is just that that particular idea that was very applicable and very productive and very valuable for a period of time is not the one that is useful to go forward with. So it's this idea: you want to be very passionate, but still be dispassionate. You you have to be able to step back and give it up every once in a while and say, well not the right thing anymore. And this old and jaded is another challenge, especially when people become more and more senior. You've seen that, you've done that. So somebody comes up and says, shall we do this, or here's a new idea. They say, oh yeah, we did that 10 years ago. You know, it, was, it didn't work out. And, and the thing is, a, a, 
uh, iPad. Uh, iPad was invented, uh, I don't know, how many people know what an Apple Newton is? Right, okay, so Apple Newton was in 1993, four, five, maybe? Something that range, right? It was very much like an iPad, uh, and, and they had a language created by a company called General Magic, you know, tap language, all kinds of stuff. Uh, but combination of technology, price point, bulkiness wasn't right. And the internet was not there, blah, blah, blah. Right? I, I, uh, so so uh, old and jaded doesn't mean uh, you have to be very careful about old and jaded because sometimes the things that you did last year, when refreshed with another combination of environmental conditions, are exactly the right thing to do this year. But it failed miserably last year. So you have to again figure out how do you survive in that model of saying, yeah, with that you know, last year or this year is too, probably too early, but certainly five years, right? Five years ago, we tried to do API program. Uh, this is actually the best example is telcos and API programs. Telcos have been talking about API programs for a very long time and try to do that for a very long time. Uh, there are a few good success stories, but for the most part, you know, you have Twilio, which is wiping out uh, telco API programs, right? But yet, a, a, it doesn't mean you can't, so you have to understand what didn't work very well, go fix those problems and do something different, right? And so forth. So, so there, are, there are things that you have to be attentive to saying, you have to be able to adapt and move along. And big part of that is this whole idea of saying, this is not some top-down thing. This is a, you know, we're gonna get together and put the best possible combination of ideas into play and see where it goes. And if it doesn't work, throw it out and do it again. Which brings, uh, which me, brings me to the next key point, which is don't bother getting it right. So a lot of people, we see this all the time, people who design architectures uh, uh, and, and solutions for big complicated problems are very careful to get everything right and they try very hard to get everything right, try to get it right for the next five, 10 years and, and they spend two, three years coming up with all this beautiful uh, stuff and then another long time doing it, by the time they get it all together, the ship sailed already, right? You've lost the market, technology has changed, people have gone, blah, blah, blah. So really, uh, you can't work like that anymore. You have to get into this iterative approach. And Asanka, when he talks, will talk a lot more about iterative architecture uh, and why that's a very important aspect. But really, it comes down to the last point. Uh, in many organizations, if somebody has a failed project, that person is doomed, right? So from promotions to whatever, that person is doomed. Like, oh, this, oh, that's the one who lost that one, right? Okay, then let's skip to find somebody else. So what that does, if you have that model, is that a, uh, you'll only, the people who go up are the people who play it safe all the time. The problem with playing it safe is if you keep playing it safe, somebody who takes a risk, not your organization, somebody else who takes a risk and does something far out will succeed or may succeed. So if you're always playing it safe, it's not gonna work. You have to fail. Right. So we, we uh, in WC2, we, uh, we always have this idea that if you don't mess something up periodically, you are not good enough. Because you're kind of then playing it so safe that you're getting it right all the time. You know, unless you're, uh, 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 nobody can get it right all the time. This is, with, with technology, it's, it's a future prediction game. Right? Everything we do is about future prediction. Saying, if you build this, they will come. And, and we keep doing that over and over again. And, and to get that right all the time means you're taking very, very baby steps. And somebody's gonna leapfrog you in no time. So you have to love failure, you have to support it, encourage it. Obviously, if the same person's failing over and over again, you know, walk them out, because clearly that's not a good fit. But in general, you can't have the mindset and the organizational culture saying, this person who made the wrong technical call or the wrong investment or whatever is now sort of damaged goods, right? You can't have that. That just destroys everything. Control your destiny. This is a very important one. So, so a lot of organizations for technical stuff eh, tended to say, well, you know, I'm gonna go to this big SI or big integrator and they will take care of everything for me. I'm gonna buy the software from one vendor and my rate and pace of innovation is proportional to their rate and pace of innovation. That doesn't work. It doesn't work because in, in a digitally transformed world, a, another quote from Mark Anderson, I think every company is a software company. That's the way of the world. It doesn't matter what you do, you have to master software to some extent, right? And then, so mastering software, getting 
some control over the technology direction, having some vision that you are driving with the support of implementation partners, all kinds of things, of course, is very, very important. And, and without that, you end up in a big mess. So there are a couple of aspects that I want to touch. Uh, now, open source, so I, obviously I'm a biased open source person because I'm a long time open source person, etc. But uh, open source uh, is not just about whether you buy software from an open source vendor. I have no problem with people buying non-open source stuff. The most important thing about open source is that open source has developed this idea that software is meant to become composable. If you take any piece of open source software, they are always written with the idea that somebody else is going to take this software and do something else with it. Right? So it's not a black box. Fundamentally, open source software tends to be not a black box. That's the big thing that you need to make sure. So it doesn't matter whether you buy something from IBM or whatever the uh, non-open source vendor. As long as they give you the ability to take things to your own hands and move it forward without having to do a change request and wait for two years for them to implement that feature that you need. Because if you do that, you are now lockstep with someone who is not in your industry, not in the same level of risk profile, and therefore doesn't understand the, the urgency of the problem that you need to solve. Right, so it's a very important aspect. The other part of open source is internal open source. The, the, the idea of encouraging developers to create things uh, without, without, uh, without control and getting access to source code. So I'll give you an example. I, I used to work in IBM Research for eight years. I was not allowed to get to the WebSphere source code because I'm a research guy. Why do you need the source code? It's not your problem, right? It's, it's somebody else's source code. It's inside the company. Right? This is silly. In today's world, this is silly. So uh, having a model of saying every bit of source code is available for everybody to read is not an issue. It, it changes dramatically what other people can see and do and help improve. Right? It's just like having APIs inside the company. The more APIs you have inside the company, an API store with the ability to just subscribe and use it without getting approval, uh, without asking for permission, same kind of level here. By doing that, you're allowing people to create things which don't require management approval and don't require pre-planning don't require design and impact analysis and benefit analysis. Most things in the world were not done like that. Linux was not created with impact analysis and benefit analysis, right? Some kid got tired of something else and said, I I'm going to try to do something different, right? And Linux is pretty much the only operating system now. There's a little bit of Windows left, but fundamentally the Unix kernel is really the only operating system around in the platform, right? And even that, uh, Windows also has a Linux uh, front end, uh, Linux uh, kernel experience now. Uh, <clears throat> So APIs are a big part of it. The idea of putting lipstick on the pig is in every enterprise, there's all kinds of stuff that keeps the lights on. You can't get rid of it. And you know, typically, you can't get rid of it. Very few customers are actually rewriting everything you've got with something new. But uh, you can make it easier to consume. You wrap it up, put some APIs in front of it, give access to it, as much as possible, obviously. If you have a mainframe and you're paying by transaction, and so forth, you have to control it a lot more, but you still provide the same experience. Maybe you need authorization to access that API, but you can still provide the same experience. The idea of becoming recomposable is very important. So today we are talking about doing social media uh, and so forth. Uh, in the next, uh, and now a little bit more about AI, in the next five years we'll be talking a lot more about virtual reality and how enterprises need to have a virtual presence somehow and figure out what that means. Uh, but if you look at a company that does something, that company's fundamental behavior is still the same. It's just that the way it interacts with the world and with consumers and with businesses now changes over time as things evolve. The idea of recomposable is keep the atoms of the organization solid and constant. That's where things like microservices are great, fundamental atomic components that are, defines what the business is. But how you interact with the world are compositions of those. So you create new compounds on top of the atoms that combine these capabilities and offer it for this purpose. And be the ability to innovate and iterate at that layer very, very fast is important. And that's what allows you to stay in the game. If some world event happens suddenly and you need to offer a new product, it shouldn't take six months, one year to offer it. It should be much, much faster. Uh, digital products, obviously. And, and to offer that, it requires the ability to be recomposable, to take the business functionality package it up in a different way, get it out to a different audience, or get it into a different channel. Right, so it's a very important aspect. <clears throat> so the last point is really working with the business. Uh, this is a point I made earlier. 
it used to be you know IT and technology and, and technology on one side, business on the other side. And this is always at loggerheads. There's tons of papers and stuff written about the IT business gap, you know, trying to make workflow work, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The reality today is if business people don't understand IT, and if IT people don't understand business, their organization is doomed. It's only a matter of time before it's completely doomed. Because if you're going to compete in any business, you are going to get somebody else coming up into that business who understands both of them. There's a new way of thinking about the business who understands technology and says, how can I apply this technology to rethink what this business is? So to get to that point, you have to bridge this gap. So the idea that you, know, you go to a meeting and the business guy says something and you say, well, yeah, I can make something work in six months to one year, and, and then you meet in six months to one year and review the progress is not good enough if you really want to do digital transformation. And it's a both sides commitment. The business side has to commit to understanding what is possible with technology and what is difficult with technology and what is impossible with technology. A lot of people don't understand that, right? I'm sure you've been in conversations where you get a request saying, uh, let's make that work. And they don't get it that that's like a pretty, pretty hard problem to solve. And then other cases, people come and say, let's make that work. And they think it's a hard problem, but it's a tiny problem. And, and that gap it has to narrow because if you don't reduce that gap, the quality of the impact that technology can have on the business will go down and the quality of the, the, the impact that business can have on technology will go down. So both sides have to meet in the middle and say we have to understand each other if we're going to really make it work. In the end, it's really about constructively destroying the business. The business as it is today in most enterprises, most uh, verticals, is going to have radical change in a period of time, over a period of time. And obviously, nobody wants to go and destroy the business. It's not about saying, oh, kill that business line, go and do something else. It's be more constructive. Figure out what's the way the future is going to be and start building towards that, sort of constructively. And then eventually, this new little baby will come up and overshadow the old one. Then the old one will die out. And that's OK. That's how it should be. All right. So uh, so what does this all mean? So first thing is. A, you know, yeah, digital transformation, blah, blah, blah. But the reality is things change slowly. Yes, you'll get some startup coming up and announcing they've changed the world, etc. But it takes time to do that. So while you have to, you know, you have to be always on your toes, always doing things and so forth, there is time. It is not like, okay, if you don't get this done in three months, this is finished. It doesn't quite work like that. Uh, and the other part is uh, people tend to take this stuff very, very seriously, saying, oh my god, if I don't do this, the world's going to fall apart. Well, yeah, you know, yeah, it's important, but it's not that serious either, because things will evolve, and there's time to evolve it. The key thing is open-mindedness and learning something new every day. Right? Things come along all the time, and today it's so much easier to learn stuff. It used to be you had to go to a meeting, you had to go to a conference, you had to read papers. Now the information is just shoved in front of you, unless you are closing your eyes and ears and your nose, you can't avoid people putting stuff at you. Right? And, and there are lots of online education sources that make, take effort to curate that information and give it to you in very, very high quality form. Whether it is learning about blockchain or learning about Bitcoin or learning about uh, some kind of new uh, a protocol, et cetera, et cetera. There's all kinds of content available. So it's possible to keep, keep on top of it all the time. Uh, finally, of course, security. Right? You can't not talk about digital. You can't talk about security. Not talk about security in the context of digital transformation. So, my personal advice to customers is: if you don't have digital identity solved in your enterprise, where you have one ID for every single person and it's all unified and single sign-on and all of that, don't do too much digital transformation because you're just sitting duck if you do that. You, you know, one thing is: if a company is not that digital, it's very hard for some malware or some ransomware or some, something else remotely to attack you because it's not digital. The more digital you are, the easier it is to attack. Right? There was a story recently of a hotel in Austria. I don't know if you guys saw it. There was a, a hotel in Austria that had put these nice uh, digital uh, NFC powered locks. And some hacker had hacked into this hotel. They locked all the rooms. So the guests are inside the rooms. And they demanded ransom to release the people. And actually, the hotel paid the ransom. It, and it only demanded 1,500 euros. So, well, that's worth a heck of a lot more than 1,500 euros. But hey, the guy was not that ambitious. The guy got the 1,500 euros. He, he or she or they unlocked the rooms. Everybody came out. Because the hotel immediately went back to 
you know, lock and key, right? Forget this digital nonsense. Uh, so security is very, very serious. If you're going to go in that path, there's no room for amateur time in security. Because if you are in amateur time in security, somebody's in there and eating you alive. All right, thank you very much. Oops, sorry. So my, my summary comment is uh, this stuff seems to always move very fast and change all over. But very, very important thing is always think long, but you've got to act short, iteratively act short. And just take small steps all the time, but keep a big vision in place and then drive towards that. All right, thank you very much. I'm uh, happy to take some questions if there's anything you want to ask. Here, Shimi. Yeah, have the mic with me. A uh, couple of lines on your future roadmap and strategy, because uh, we haven't seen anything on that. Yeah, I'm going to talk towards the end a little bit about the products in the last section, so I'll talk a bit about the uh, roadmap and strategy. I assume you meant on the technology side, right? Yeah, so I'll talk at the end a little bit about it. And the VN of your organization for the next few years. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, but again, same rules apply to us. So we think long, we act short. So I can tell you my thinking for the next five, ten years, but we don't have a roadmap for five, ten years. Because uh, I had another slide in, in uh, we, I sometimes talk about anybody who says they have a roadmap for five years has no clue what they're talking about. Because you can't have a roadmap for five years in technology. The world's going to change way too much. So we know overall what our vision is and directions are very, to a very clear position, but not the details of what we can release next year. I have no idea. The question, but I'll, the question I'm raising is that because uh, few of the products from your side, especially the identity manager and the API manager, yeah. we are trying to use in future. So just we just want to see the oh, future of those products. Absolutely. So we can plan on that. Absolutely. That's the purpose very of Very happy to do that, yes. I will talk about that. Sure. Hi, you mentioned earlier about um, you know people being born into the digital age now, but obviously we're at a point where you've got people who are it's all natural to them, and then you've got people that have grown up with it. Um, how did you tackle that sort of cultural issues within WSO2 itself? Um, excellent question. So, so uh, it's so sim first answer is it's, it's really quite a challenge uh, getting people who are inherently into the digital way of thinking along with people who are sort of you know, struggling along with it and coming along with it. Uh, what we, the, the primary vehicle we use in WC2 is over-communication. Uh, it's just a, we're kind of a wacky company. We have 500 person company, 460 plus like 50 interns usually. Every email that goes to anybody is copied to everybody. So every email, so if you guys are customer and one of our account managers or technical people sent you a mail, every single employee in the company can read that mail can being the keyword, right? Obviously, you get more than a thousand email messages a day, you're not going to read. Uh, if you do that, uh, you won't be able to do anything else. Uh, one of the objectives there is to create this approach of there's nothing that we need to hide from somebody else. Right? So once I had this customer who sent a mail or who threatened on some support ticket saying, hey, if you guys don't fix this quickly, I'm going to escalate to the CEO. And now in that case, uh, I was aware that issue was going on. So I put a comment saying, hey, don't worry, we are monitoring this already. Right, so, so you know, so whereas in in, in IBM, uh, I, I, the stuff that went into WebSphere from code that I wrote, I had zero access to any kind of support tickets or anything. I wasn't allowed to talk to a customer because you know I'm not the guy who's involved with that job responsibility. So you have to change that culture, saying this is a collective responsibility model, and create an environment where people are, are able to communicate and not worry about impact and so forth. Obviously, there's a lot of trust involved. You know, you trust that somebody is not going to say something silly to a customer. You know, every, literally every person in the company can see every message we've sent any of you guys. Right? A, and that's a pretty risky thing to do because somebody can say something stupid. And we've had that happen a few times. You apologize and say, you know, mistakes happen.